Hello, this is Dr. Armand bringing you another exciting lecture in the realm of General Chemistry 2. In this lecture, we'll be talking about reaction mechanisms, elementary steps, the rate elementary steps or elementary reactions, the rate determining step, and how to write simple reaction mechanisms. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So before we begin the lecture, we're going to start off with a little bit of an example problem from a previous lecture. So in this uh, problem, we have an energy diagram and wants to know which of the following statements are correct. So let's go ahead and start looking at each statement. So statement A says point B is the delta H of reaction. So point B is the difference in energy between the reactants and products. And so this is correct. Point B is the delta H of reaction. B and F, one says endothermic reaction, one says exothermic reaction. And so if, if, if it's an endothermic reaction, well, then it can't be an exothermic reaction. And if it's an exothermic reaction, it can't be an endothermic reaction. So the characteristics of an endothermic reaction on the energy diagram is that the products are higher in energy than the reactants. And likewise, for an exothermic reaction, the products are lower in energy than the reactants. And so here we see that the products are higher in energy than the reactants. So this is an endothermic reaction. It is not a exothermic reaction reaction. Are the products more stable? Well, since the products are a higher energy than the reactants, this means that the products are less stable. When the products are lower in energy than the reactants, the products are more stable. So this is an incorrect state. Point B is the activation energy. No, it's not. Point B is the delta H. Actually, point A is the activation energy. And lastly, reactants are favored. Uh, this is correct because the reactants are lower in energy. That would infer that the reactants are more stable, aka more favored than the products. This is how you interpret the energy diagram. Now moving on to the topics in this lecture, we'll be looking at rate mechanisms and the different components of rate mechanisms. So when we talk about a, or excuse me, reaction mechanism, not rate. So when we talk about reaction mechanisms, we're looking at a sequence, and this is very important. We're looking at a sequence of molecular events or reaction steps that describe the pathway from reactants to products. So we're looking at this reaction on the molecular level. What molecules of A does it react with molecule B and what is formed? So this is a little bit different than looking at a regular chemical equation, which deals with moles. We're looking at individual molecules and how they react so that we go from reactant or reactants to products. And this is what a reaction mechanism is explaining how the reaction occurs. And so to, to write the reaction mechanism, we use elementary uh, steps, which is a single step in the reaction mechanism. So step one could be a molecule of A reacts with another molecule of A to form molecule C. That's a elementary step. And then step two is a molecule C reacts with a molecule of B to form a molecule of B and so forth. So we're going to be using elementary steps to produce the reaction mechanism. Now the elementary step is different than the overall reaction. So the overall reaction, we combine all the steps together and we get the overall chemical equation. Now elementary steps deal with individual molecules, overall reaction deals with moles and stoichiometry. So once we combine all the steps, now we're no longer dealing with individual molecules, we're dealing with moles and stoichiometry for the overall reaction. 
So actually from the elementary steps, we can write the rate law because we're dealing with individual molecules. And so molecularity describes the number of molecules on the reactant side of the equation for each elementary step. So if you look at the number of molecules on the reactant side of an elementary step, you can determine the molecularity of that equation. Now, one other thing we have to look at is in some of these reaction mechanisms, we may produce and consume species that are not necessarily in the overall equation. And these are called reaction intermediates. So again, a reaction intermediate doesn't appear in the overall equation. It just gets produced in one step and consumed in another step. So we have to watch out for reaction intermediates as these don't show up or these should not show up in the rate law. So again, with elementary steps, we can write the rate law for those steps because we're dealing with individual molecules. Whereas in the overall reaction, we're dealing with moles and stoichiometry. So what are these elementary steps? Well, there are four common elementary steps that we look at. We have a unimolecular step, which is just involving one reactant molecule. And so the rate law is Ka, it's a first order. Then we have two types of bimolecular steps. One type of bimolecular step is two molecules of one type of reactant. And you see the, over, the order of reaction is two. So rate equals Ka squared. Another type of biomolecular step is A plus B. And so you see that the rate is first order in respect to A, first order in respect to B, but overall it's a second order equation. Again, we can write the rate law for elementary steps because they're dealing with individual molecules. Now for term molecular step, usually it involves two reactants of one type of molecule and one of the other, so that you get an overall order of reaction of three. Now you may say, well, why don't we have an elementary step that involves three molecules of one type of reactant? And the reason is I explained this as well, but this is because it becomes very um, unstable or highly unlikely that three molecules could react like this. I mean, it is possible, but it's highly unlikely. That's why we don't include that one in the term molecular step. So there are three types of molecularities. We have unimolecular. There's only one type. You start with one reactant. For bimolecular, there are two types. You can have two of the same reactants or two different reactants. And term molecular, we have two of one type of reactant molecule and another reactant molecule. And these are the elementary steps we're going to use to describe reaction mechanisms. So again, as you go into higher chemistry, you may learn about different types of molecularity, but these are the ones that we're going to use for general chemistry too. Now, let's look at some examples. So in these different examples, we want to identify the molecularity in each reaction, each elementary reaction, excuse me, and so we want to look at how many molecules of reactants we have. So in A, we just have O3 and O. So this would be a unimolecular step. And it's, oh, excuse me, not unimolecular, molecular, bimolecular step. And the rate law will be rate equals K. In B, we have one reactant. So this would be a unimolecular step. The rate will be rate equals K. that. 
In C, notice we have three reactants. Two of them are the same, one of them is different. So that's a total of three molecules. So this is a termolecular step. And rate equals K V R squared A R. And uh, D, we have one molecule for a reactant. So this would be a uni molecular step. The rate equals K and O2. Same for E. E only has one molecule of I2. So this would be a uni molecular step. Rate equals K I2. Again, the reason we can write the rate law for elementary steps is because we're dealing with individual molecules. And then lastly, we have two molecules of NO one molecule of BR2. We have a total of three molecules. So this would be a termolecular step rate equals K NO squared BR. So that's how you determine the molecularity of elementary reactions. Now we're going to use these to write the reaction mechanism, explaining how we go from reactants to products. So here we want to know in this reaction mechanism, what are the reaction intermediates? So if you remember from earlier in this lecture, reaction intermediate is produced one step and consumed in another. So it's always produced and then consumed. So when we look at this uh, mechanism here, we want to know what gets produced and then consume. So two molecules of NO react to form N2O2. And then this molecule of N2O2 reacts in step two to form your product. And so this N2O2 is a reaction intermediate. It gets produced in one step and consumed in another. So when you write the overall equation, you get 2NO plus BR2 yields 2NOBR as well. So you see it doesn't show up in the overall equation. So reaction intermediate gets produced in one step, consumed in another. So here we have this reaction mechanism. It gives us a plausible mechanism for this reaction, and it wants us to determine the rate law. So the one thing you have to, to remember is that the, to determine the rate law, you need the rate determining step. And the rate determining step is always the slowest step. So you start with the rate determining step and you write the rate law for that. And you want to make sure that no reaction intermediates are in that rate law that you write. So the rate determining step is the slowest step. And in this example, it tells us that step one is the slow step. So we're going to look and write the rate law for this 
biomolecular step. So there's one molecule H2, one molecule of IBR. So when we write the rate law, this rate law contains no reaction intermediates. And so this would be the rate law for, this would be a plausible mechanism for this reaction because the rate law is a plausible rate law. So the correct answer would be this. Now I'm going to show you how you can take the mechanism and write the energy diagram. And this is some cool stuff to do. So you have your energy. Now, I don't know if it's exo or endothermic. We'll just assume that it's exothermic. And so this is energy here. This is reaction progress. So what we're going to do is we'll start at reactants. Now, since there's two steps, there are two humps in the energy diagram. The first hump should be the largest because it's the slowest step. So it's going to be something like this. And then we go through a reaction intermediate. And then we go down. And since I said it's exothermic, the products are lower than the reactants. So if we were to write this. The H2 plus IBR. Here we're going to have HI plus IBR or HBR. So here we have a reaction intermediate HI. It's only produced here, and then it gets consumed when we form products. So this is step one, step two. So you see HI gets produced here, and then it gets consumed in step two. And the products are two HBR. So this is how you take the mechanism and write the energy diagram. Now, again, I just assumed that uh, this would be exothermic. And the, the reason I assumed that was because, for example, IBR is a non, almost nonpolar, uh, probably it is nonpolar bond, and HBR is a polar bond or more polar than IBR. So I would assume that it would be more stable. And then, of course, the other product would be uh, I2. So when we start with reactants. Step one is the slow step. It's going to have the highest activation energy. Then we form an intermediate HI. Then we go through the second step. The second step, um, HI gets consumed, and then we form our products. Here we want to know, this is the proposed mechanism, write a balanced overall balance equation for the overall reaction, write the rate law for each step, and determine the molecularity of each step. So step one is unimolecular. And the rate law will be rate equals K H2O2 the second step H2O2 plus OH that's a biomolecular step rate K H two O two and then OH. 
And then the last step is also a biomolecular rate equals K H O two OH. Now the overall reaction, we add up the react the reactants, we add up the products, we cross out what's the same. So here, uh, two moles of OH on the product side, two moles of OH on the reactant side. These get crossed out. Uh, HO2 aqueous on the product side, HO2 aqueous on the reactant side, they get crossed out. And our balanced overall equation would be 2H2O2 aqueous yields 2H2O liquid plus O2 gas. Now, it doesn't tell us what the slow step is, but just from looking at this, I would assume that the second step is the slow step. Let's just assume the second step is the slow step. So if this is the slow step, let's write the energy diagram for this reaction mechanism. So again, we need energy and we need reaction progress. And since there are three steps, we're going to have three humps on the energy diagram. Now, since we're going from the decomposition of H2O2, I will assume that the, this is a tough one, but I'll assume that the products are more stable than the reactants, so we'll say this is exothermic. So we start with the reactants, now rate two, or excuse me, step two, we assume is a slow step. So we have step one, step two, and then step three. And then we come down, we have our products. So again, the reactant is H2O2. The first intermediate produces 2OH, so it gets produced and then consumed. So the first reaction intermediate, I'll put it below the energy well, is 2OH. We go through the second step, we produce another reaction intermediate, HO2, and it gets consumed in the third step. And so our product, H2O liquid plus O2 gas. So again, each step requires its own activation energy. So we go through step one, we form an intermediate. We go through step two, we form an intermediate. We go through step three, we form our products. Now we assume that the second step was the slow step, and that's why it has the highest energy barrier. So the slow step will always have the highest energy barrier. So one more uh, example of this, then we'll move on to catalyst. We have these series of elementary steps. We want to identify any intermediates in the mechanism and assuming the step two is the slow step show that the mechanism is consistent with the observed rate law uh, given to us. So they say step two is the slow step. So reaction intermediate gets consumed, or gets, excuse me, gets produced and then consumed in the next, in the following steps. So here we have Cl2 gives us two Cl. CL gets consumed in the second and third step. So CL 
the radical is a reaction intermediate. In the second step, we produce HCl and CCl3. CCl3 gets produced in one step, consumed in another. So CCl3 is a reaction intermediate. Those are two reaction intermediates in this mechanism. Now we need to show that the mechanism is consistent with the observed rate law. So again, we're going to start with the first, or excuse me, we're going to start with the rate determining step, which is the slow step to start the rate law. So rate equals K CL CH CL3. Now this doesn't equal what's given to us, but here we have to notice that our rate law has a reaction intermediate. And so we need to see if it's possible to get rid of the reaction intermediate. And this is careful, you gotta pay attention here. So since our rate law has a reaction intermediate, we gotta see if it's plausible to get rid of it. And what we're gonna look at is, we're gonna look at step one, and because since it's reversible, which is what the double arrow means, it means it's reversible. This means that the rate of forward reaction equals rate of reverse reaction. So the rate of the forward reaction is K Cl2 equals C, uh, excuse me, we'll say. K1, Cl2, K negative 1, Cl squared. Now to solve for Cl, we get that Cl equals K1 divided by K negative 1 times Cl2 to the one half. And so since CL2, now we, excuse me, since we have an expression for CL, now we can substitute CL in our rate law with this expression here. So for CL, we're going to substitute this in for CL. So we get rate equals K2 times K1 divided by K negative 1. Cl2 to the one half times CH Cl3. So now all these K's we can just write collectively as a K. And we have the rate law. So here our mechanisms rate law and our experimental rate law are the same. So this is a plausible mechanism. So let's say this reaction is exothermic. And again, the way the reason I'm saying is exothermic is because maybe Cl, Cl4 gas is a little bit more stable than Cl2. And let's write the energy diagram for this. So again, we're going to need energy. And we're going to need reaction progress. So we start with reactants. We have our first step. We form a reaction intermediate. Our second step is the rate determining step. We form a reaction intermediate. And then the third step, and then down to products. So our reactant, Cl2, we're just going on based on step one. We start with Cl2 here. We form two chlorine radicals as a reaction intermediates. In step two, we form CCl3 
as a reaction intermediate, and then we get our products HCl plus CCl4. Actually, I made a, maybe a boo boo in the previous example. I should have wrote the rest of the reactants so plus. There we go. So again, three steps, three activation energies. Since the second step is the slow step, it has the greatest energy barrier. We form two react two reaction intermediates in the process. So this would be a, what the energy diagram would look like for this mechanism if it was exothermic. Now, one thing you can add to a reaction is a catalyst. And what a catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy barrier so that you can form products and reactants more easily. So the uncatalyzed reaction, very high activation energy barrier. You add a catalyst, the energy barrier decreases, making it easier for reactants and products to form. So again, a catalyst doesn't get consumed. It's used in one step, produced in the next step. So here you see catalyst is consumed in the first step. The catalyst comes back in the second step. It crosses out. Now C here is a reaction intermediate. And it also gets crossed out. So then you just have A plus B is product. We look at this reaction. See, in the first step, we have a chlorine radical gets consumed. In the second step, it gets reproduced. This is a catalyst. We can cross it out. Now, CLO radical is produced in one step, consumed in another. This is a reaction intermediate. This is a catalyst. That's the difference between the two. And so the overall reaction would be O3 plus O. The composition of ozone. So there are different types of catalysts. There are heterogeneous catalysts where the reactants and catalysts are in different phases, such as the uh, catalyst could be a solid, the reactants could be gases, or homogeneous catalysts where reactants and catalysts are in the same phase. So one of the most common heterogeneous catalysts is your catalytic converter, which is a solid catalyst. So it's a heterogeneous catalyst. And the reactants are gases. And what it does is it helps take harmful gases from the engine exhaust and convert it into less harmful gases. And so that's what a catalyst does. So it takes, for example, nitrogen monoxide and converts it into nitrogen and oxygen, as shown here. So these uh, two molecules of nitrogen monoxide go to the catalyst, and then they come off as nitrogen and oxygen gas. So we can even have biological catalysts. These are called enzymes. And enzymes significantly increase the rate of biochemical reactions anywhere from a million to 10 to the 18th. But they're highly specific on what they catalyze. And these act only on certain reactant molecules called substrates. So there are enzymes are very specific 
on what they react with, and these are called uh, substrates. So one example is to talk about catalysts and hangovers. And so we have alcohol dehydrogenase, ADH, and aldehyde dehydrogenase that catalyze the metabolism of ethanol. And so what we have here is, let's say you consume ethanol, as you consume ethanol, you start to form acetoaldehyde. As it metabolizes the ethanol, it goes to acetoaldehyde. And acetoaldehyde gives you the hangover effects, which include headache, nausea, vomiting. And then the acetoaldehyde, with the help of enzymes, and water is converted to acetic acid. And acetic acid doesn't give you any of those harmful side effects. If you ever notice, sometimes when some person has drank too much, they usually give off the odor of vinegar. And that's because their body is metabolizing the acetoaldehyde into acetic acid. Now you may ask, you know, from a chemistry perspective, you see that water is one of the reactants in the conversion of acetoaldehyde to acetic acid. And so based on Le Chatelier's principle, which we'll talk about later, if you increase the concentration of water or you increase the amount of water, then since you're increasing a reactant, it's going to produce more product. And if you're producing more product, you're going to use more reactants. So if you drank a lot of water, it would help minimize the effect of the hangover of feeling. Now, it's not recommended to drink, but, you know, this is just chemistry here explaining the chemical uh, reactions. So here we wanted to identify the catalyst in this reaction. And again, a catalyst is consumed and then produced. So here we see the Cl radical is consumed in the first step produced in the second step. So Cl radical is a catalyst, whereas the ClO radical is a reaction intermediate. So that concludes the lecture on reaction mechanisms. Again, some of the key points from reaction mechanisms is A, from the elementary steps, we can determine the molecularity and the rate law because we're dealing with individual molecules. B, we take the different elementary steps, we put them together, we get a mechanism. And from the mechanism, we write the rate law based on the rate determining step, which is the slow step. We also showed how you take the mechanism and write the energy diagram. We discussed reaction intermediates and catalysts and the difference between those two. And we explained about the different types of catalysts. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. If you did, hit the like button. And until next time, Dr. Armand signing off.